Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this Tuesday Scholar event. Our speaker today is Julia Steenberg, who will address the topic, Minnesota Meteor. What can it tell us? Julia Steenberg is a researcher at the University of Minnesota and a member of the Minnesota Geological Survey. Today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with the financial support of Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn, to turn things over to our speaker, Julia Steenberg, on the topic, A Minnesota Meteor, What Can It Tell Us? Thank you. Hello. Thanks for having me, Judy. I, I do have to make one correction. I do not have a PhD, so you don't have to call me doctor. Uh, I have a master's and I've been working at the Minnesota Geological Survey with the U of M for over 15 years now and as I've, uh, um, I'm research faculty. So um, that's, that's my story. Um, but really great to be here. Uh, excited that there's so many of you interested in Minnesota's geology. Um, so hopefully, uh, you enjoy this presentation. It, it, it may become maybe more technical than some that you've had in the past, but um, um, I, I think you'll enjoy it. So let's get started. Um, today, I'm going with um, an outline here, and I'm going to start with uh, what the Minnesota Geological Survey is and the, the mapping, the geologic mapping that we do. Um, and then I'm going to go over the regional and local geology. Um, because it's important to sort of set the stage of what should be there and um, and how we recognize that there is this structure and that's there instead, um, this structure that we're calling the Pine Bend impact structure. I'll go over a lot of the geologic data that we use to um, put this together and understand it. And, and that includes some of the shocked quartz that we found in the subsurface samples. And then I'll go over some initial interpretations of the structure um, that we think is in the ground um, beneath um, in the pine in the sort of historical name for the area is the Pine Bend area but right along the Mississippi River um, and this um, picture on the right the Mississippi River Pine Bend Bluff scientific and natural area that's taken right there at the site so it, it's um it's a beautiful um, DNR swath of land there to um, to check out sometime you can know that you're walking over an ancient crater. Um, and then I'll do some comparison with um, some other impact structures in the region um, as well as we finish up. Are you seeing my, my full screen or are these Zoom controls kind of in the way? Hopefully. I think it looks fine. Okay, perfect. They're in my way, but that, that seems to be the case. I can I can make them go away on my end. Um, so the Minnesota Geological Survey is part of the University of Minnesota. Specifically, we are part of the um, School of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And we've got our own um, building. We are, um, you know, we have a, a map sales office and a small little collection of rocks to see in our lobby. But that's our address. And um, but everything we produce and make is available for free as electronic files um, on our website. And that's listed there. It's just CSE for College of Science and Engineering, University of Minnesota, EDU, and uh, MGS for, for short for Minnesota Geological Survey. So we like to consider ourselves just, you know, um, a department that exists to serve the people of Minnesota to provide systematic geoscience information to support the stewardship of our land, water, and mineral resources. And we do that mostly through geologic mapping. Um, so that's just a screenshot of our website on the on both of these pictures here. You can see how some of our collections we have um, that you can um, peruse online if you're interested. The main mapping program we do at the Geological Survey, and this is the program of how we came across this ancient crater, is um, what's called what's known as the I'm getting up. Um, is what's known as the County Geologic Atlas Program, and that's a study of the the geology and groundwater resources of a county. 
So we investigate the geology and we produce maps and what's called GIS products, which is a specific mapping computer software. Um, so those are some of the images you see in the center there. So there's just different ways to look at things in um, two and three dimensions of the different geologic layers. So those are some of the things that we produce other than paper maps. Um, and then the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, comes in after we, we do and is also involved in the County Geologic Atlas program and produces what's called a Part B, which is a story of, you know, we like to think of, we, we sort of build the building blocks of the geology and, and what it's composed of. And the DNR comes in and they tell us about, they do studies on the groundwater chemistry and the quantity and the quality and pollution sensitivity in the area. So they do more of the groundwater focus um, aspects of these maps. And, and they're used together for um, planning, environmental protection, education, and better decision-making. So let's start off with um, the geology, the bedrock geology of Minnesota and Wisconsin at a glance here. Um, so if you removed all of the overlying, what, what I call glacial sediments or quaternary, that's the name of the age of those glacial sediments. If you remove them all, um, you'd, you'd be left with a beautiful geologic landscape, um, much like you'd see out west of different rock layers. And Minnesota's got quite a unique um, setting in terms of geology. We have the hard, pre what are known as Precambrian or the older geologic layers are, are a mix of igneous and metamorphic rocks. Um, those are in northern Minnesota and those gray colors you see there, the what's known as the Paleozoic rocks, the Paleozoic age geologic formations. Those occur mostly in the southeast part of the state, including the metro area here. And then we've got a little bit of what's known as the Mesozoic age rocks. And that's actually the age of like, say the Cretaceous rock formations that um, are known to have 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 the dinosaur age rocks in them, right? So those are those occur in Minnesota, and they're mostly in the southwest part of the state. Um, so it, in the bottom here is just a geologic cross section, uh, basically a slice through the state from the A to the north down to A prime to the south. So you can just see that those Paleozoic layers are generally flat lying and um, you know, the oldest stack is at the bottom and the youngest is on top and they form and some and, and mostly mostly flat lying, but a little bit of a basin here. And and the the structure we found in the maps and the regional geology I'm going to talk about is mostly in the metro area and, and mainly Dakota County. So that's what the star represents. Now those rocks are um, are um, composed mostly of th about three different types of, of sediments. And these are um, sedimentary rocks. They were deposited by ancient marine seas. Um, so we have both sand, just a basic quartz sandstone, which you see there, the nice um, translucent rounded quartz grains. We've got sort of a, a, a fine grain sandstone, mostly uh, also includes shale and silt and that's the picture you see in the middle there. And then we have carbonate, um, or what's kind of a general term for both either dolomite or limestone. So that's sort of the gray crystalline. They can be gray or tan in Minnesota, and that's what you see there on the right. And if you look at that same cross section of those layers from the previous slide, you'll see that kind of how those, what those different formations are composed of sort of in a stack at the bottom. Uh, the lowermost layers are, are predominantly sand, coarse sandstone and fine sandstone. That's that yellow and, and brown colors you see there. And then the upper formations or the younger ones, those are dominated more by the carbonate rocks. All right. So in and around Dakota County, um, the image on the upper left here is just the, the surface elevation. Um, it's in, and it's enhanced a little bit. Um, and the red notes uh, where there is bedrock exposed at the surface. So of course, you know, you look across Dakota County, you don't see bedrock uh, layers at the surface. You see mostly the glacial deposits, but, but the, where we do have the bedrock layers exposed are mostly along the Miss, Minnesota and Mississippi River Valleys, as you can see along the valleys here. And then there is a fair amount in southeast part of Dakota County where there is just thinner glacial materials. 
So just to go over some of those rocks we have in the area, in the metro area, here's the Decora Shale exposed at, um, near the Lilydale brick, Brickyards. Um, so you can see that gray shale. And there's some little thin beds of limestone in there. And then you've likely seen these exposures as you drive around St. Paul or downtown St. Paul. Um, we've got this, I think, was from Shepherd Road, where we have the Platteville Formation, which is a limestone on the top. And then there's a thin Glenwood shale layer and then the white um, St. Peter sandstone. And so those are some of the formations we see around the area. And um, the next the next ones down are known as the Prairie du Chien group, which includes the Shakopee and the Oneota. Here's some pictures of that Prairie du Chien group. And that's those are what you see more down by Hastings. Um, so this is the geologic map of the area. And it's just to show you that those those uh, the Platteville limestone and St. Peter sandstone, that's these colors up in here and also a little bit sporadically down here, these lighter blues. That's where the Prairie du Chien exists, exists below the Quaternary Rocks. Um, so that's where those are exposed. So you get more of these formations visible at the surface in and around this area down, you know, Invergrove Heights down towards Hastings. And the neck, and the only other unit that we have exposed at the surface in Dakota County is just the uppermost part of the Jordan sandstone. So that's, you can see those nice white to tan sandstone layers in there. Um, to learn about the rocks deeper than that, we have to use uh, a variety of other techniques. Uh, we have a collection of drill cuttings. So anytime a water well or any scientific um, boring gets drilled and they have a certain type of bit on their big drill rig, uh, they'll, they'll collect ground up rock as they drill down and that rock comes back up to the surface and, they, and they'll do a collection. So we have a wide variety of these we call drill cuttings um, in our in our warehouse here at the Geological Survey. And that's what our mappers use to sort of identify what rocks are in the subsurface. And so here's what some of those look like. Um, below the Jordan is the St. Lawrence Formation. So that's a nice kind of ground up gray shale. And then the next unit below that is called the Tunnel City Group. And that sort of looks like this salt and pepper fine sandstone. It's got uh, little grains of quartz and another mineral in there that's making that dark color called glauconite. And then below that, there's a bit of a coarser sand. So you can see that the, the, those grain sizes of quartz are, are a little bit coarser. And that's a unit we call the Wanawak sandstone. And then the next two are the Eau Claire, which you can see is a little bit more shaly. Um, and then the Mount Simon, which goes back to a sandstone. So there's this other, um, other than the cuttings, we have this other tool in the subsurface that are called geophysical locks. So it's a, just a, this, it, basically we have a, a truck that, that can go into some of these wells and produce um, this, this gamma log is what we call it. And it's just a measure of the natural uh, gamma radiation in the rocks. And, it's all very natural low levels, but the shales give off more of a signal than the co pure quartz sand. So, so these high kicks versus these low kicks are just another what we call geologic tool or stratigraphic tool that we use to kind of understand the subsurface where we don't have it exposed. Now, beneath all of those Paleozoic rocks. We have more rocks. Uh, we have what are the older, uh, what are what are known as the Mesoproterozoic uh, aged rocks, and those relate all the way back to the 1.1 billion year um, mid-continent rift, uh, where the continent, where Minnesota or North America tried to split apart, but it was a failed rift, and it eventually got pushed back together. But it opened up enough where we had all this basalt and lava flow coming out. Um, and so here you can see some examples of core from, from lava rock. And these are the rocks you'd see as you go up towards Duluth as well. And then it was later filled in with a variety of different shale and sandstone sediments as well. And that's what you see here. Um, this uh, beautifully colored image on the right, that's what we like to call sort of the MRI of Minnesota, right? This is a measure of sort of where the magnetic rocks are and or the iron bearing rocks are. And these basalts carry a higher signature of iron in them and magnetic, tiny magnetic minerals. And they produce these bright pink and white colors 
um, versus the sands and shales, which produce, or, or even other units like granite, which produces the grays or the, the greens and blues. So that's the general geologic um, story of all of our formations in the Twin Cities. Um, if we look at the subsurface data, so if we zoom into the metro area right here, kind of northern Dakota County, um, that's what that's kind of what we're looking at here on this map. And so you can see St. Paul, Minneapolis, kind of the more densely urban streets. Um, and then Inver as you go south, you get to um, southern Invergrove Heights, and that's where the structure is that I'm going to be talking about along the Mississippi River here. Um, and it right, um, Highway 52 goes right through it, so you've likely driven over it. Um, and so all the dots and, and, and symbols that you see uh, on this map are just to show you that we have a pretty good subsurface data set to work with. It's a metro area. It's, it's um, you know, there's been plenty of reasons for either uh, water wells to be drilled for, for residential purposes or industrial purposes um, or so on. So all those yellow cross um, crosses are where we have these rock cuttings to work with and look at. And then those squares are where we have those geophysical logs to work with. And then any just simple black dot is where there's just a water well record uh, of any uh, well that's being drilled at that site that's in what's known as the Minnesota Well Index, which is something you can look up. If you have a well, you can look up your well record if it's in the database. And, and the, the drillers basically have to, to write out the geologic material they encountered at depth and at what footage. So, so geologists like me that make maps, we use a lot of just drillers' descriptions of these water wells as well as the cuttings and, and, and gamma logs. And as I was mapping Dakota County, um, you know, and I should say, you know, the the geologic layers are pretty straightforward. Um, and I think we've sort of said that before, but um, so it was, it's kind of rare to come across an area where you can't really make sense of the data. You know, these formations were very expansive throughout Southeast Minnesota. They may change in thickness a little, but but their, their stacking pattern of, you know, sand, shale, limestone, you know, stays consistent throughout throughout Minnesota for the most part. But, but as I was mapping Dakota County, for the County Geologic Atlas program, um, there was definitely a spot in all this green where the data didn't match the surrounding data that was um, to be expected for the site. And here's what that looks like if you're curious from above. So this large swath of land is that Pine Bend Bluffs and Scientific Natural Area. Here's the Mississippi River. Uh, we're north of Flint Hills in this kind of industrial area. And also we have residential um, to the north. It is about a, a four kilometer across zone. Um, so I, I mentioned this before, this is just, you know, we, you know, Regionally, we have a pretty good sense of what to what formations we'll encounter at depth, and we don't get that many surprises in our mapping as we go through things. But we do a lot of refinement, a lot of database management, and um, a lot of just um, GIS products with every map we make that are that are um, used by the county and other state agencies for planning and so on. But um, so so this is just. If we're working, we were working right here, and we'd expect sort of just this these basic layers that we'd encounter at depth. Um, but we didn't quite get that. So I I mentioned those. I know this there's a lot to work, look at on this slide, but but there are wells off in Dakota County. This W stands for West, and this E, e stands for East, and those correlate to this log and this log. And I had mentioned that those geophysical logs, those gamma logs are just a way where we can basically see the stratigraphy um, very nicely. And so you can look at the west, um, you can just look at the curve, just the relative curve of things. And you can look at one off in Washington County and you can already get a sense of, well, this one, you know, looks a lot like this one. And this low, it looks like this low and they occur at, a, you know, they're all, at about the same elevation as which we'd expect. 
Um, but there were several gamma logs in this central area um, where all those green dots were on my last map that that didn't make sense. You know, this doesn't match this very nicely, and this doesn't match this at all. Um, and there's just a lot going on here in terms of the peaks, and, and it's very unexpected for the area. So I'm going to go through a couple of show you a couple of the photographs from the cutting sets um, from, from the area. Not all of them have geologic samples associated with them, but the ones with these asterisks do. So the first one I'm gonna show you is this one right here. So just so you can see the, the, the geology that, so these are, again, these are drill cuttings, so that's not, um, so they're ground up a little bit in these five foot intervals. Uh, but right out of the box, this one uh, didn't really, just seemed quite odd for the area. Excuse me. Um, again, the, the, the gamma log didn't look right and the samples don't look right in terms of their color um, and everything. So if we look closer and, and so it, basically these ones from the top, um, were described as red shale, but there was no sample um, in to take. But but the next one down, some of these samples, that that interval has what are these what are just looking like these poorly sorted quartz grains, but they are kind of they have all these little fractures into them. You know, they're not those clear translucent grains of of sand I showed you earlier. So they're a little different, sort of cloudy looking. And the next photograph down in those those deep red intervals, um, those are still pretty red uh, at, when you look at them close up, and they're composed of quartz, but they're also composed of feldspars um, and other rock types like rhyolite and basalt, which are very odd for for the Paleozoic section. That's mostly when you see a sandstone layer, it should all be pretty pure quartz. Um, so they remind us more, they look more like what we'd call those pre-Cambrian mid-continent rift sediments, with, but they're much higher in elevation than they should be. They should be much deeper. And the sample below that, that's the fine, so where we get sort of another mix of this sort of um, whitish fractured quartz sand grains. Um, you can see there, and then below that, um, we're getting real fine grain quartz sand, and it has these um, these little fossils in it that are um, little uh, broken up bits of phosphatic brachiopods. And there's also some of these little small grains of that black uh, glauconite mineral, blackish green. And so that's an interval that's part of those Cambrian sandstone units, specifically. Um, you don't only get those brach brachiopods in either the Tunnel City group or the Eau Claire group. So that's a little bit of a hint of what we're looking at. But again, there's something's clearly going on here. The, the um, you know, we shouldn't have these deep Precambrian red plastics above these rocks. And these odd fractured um, quartz grains aren't, aren't quite um, like anything we had, had seen before either. So let's look at those quartz grains a little bit more close up. Um, you can see them circled here. That's, that's sort of the fractured ones versus the non-fractured ones. Um, and this is a little bit closer what they look like under the microscope, um, sort of non-fractured and then fractured. And those fractured grains, they occur mostly in that uppermost section of the geology, um, but they do occur a little bit deeper as well. And we got excited on this. Um, you know, it you know it seemed highly unlikely or even totally implausible that we stumbled upon a meteorite crater from these quartz grains. But but those fractured grains look close enough like what we had seen just recently published in Iowa of a structure that they've named the Decora structure in Decora, Iowa, where they had quartz sand grains and fractured quartz sand grains in from the St. Peter interval. And it was determined that those quartz sand grains is what they look like on a slide under the mic on a under a petrographic microscope. And um, 
they were determined that they're sort of narrow enough, even enough, uh, closely spaced enough where they are what are called planar deformation features or for short PDFs. And those are considered diagnostic of a meteorite impact because meteorite impacts carry such great, um, basically, pressure and temperature that gets created from the, you know, the hit that to produce that fine of, of, of a fracture in a single gr in grains of quartz, you need to have very, very high pressures. So we sent our samples off to, to get some thin sections and here's some of our initial pictures. And we do have, you know, nicely fractured grains close up under the petrographic microscope in several different orientations, typically two to three orientations. Um, and here's, an, here's another sample as well. Again, several orientations and um, these little um, structures you see along the grain, those are actually thought to be called, thought to be something called a fluid inclusion where it broke and then there's a little bit of inclusions uh, along that grain along that fracture boundary. Um, so again, if I didn't make this clear, I, I don't, you know, this this has been an incredible discovery, but I'm not, um, you know, I don't study meteorites or impact craters for a living. I do mostly geologic mapping. So, so we just sort of said that, you know, we had to reach out to the experts for sort of the microscopic analysis to say, is this, is this really shocked quartz? Um, so we're working both with the University of Brazil and the Natural History Museum in Vienna, um, some, some um, experts there who have sort of looked at some of our samples, sort of gotten some, some better thin sections made and said, yes, you've got some very nice what are called planar fractures. Um, that's this image on the lower left. Um, so, and you've also got some of what are called uh, planar deformation features. So so notice the scale bar. These are much more finer features than these. Um, and and um, the, in terms of their structure, they're, they're just several micrometers apart. Um, they're just these individual planes of, of sort of amorphous material at a, at a very, very um, fine spacing. And um, some of them do appear to have what are those fluid inclusions, which basically just help you in identifying that um, to, to look for fractures. So that's some of our examples of, of what we're seeing from those sand grains up close. And um, like I was saying, you know, in terms of the impact crater, um, but from studying other craters in the past, um, we've got sort of a sense of, um, in terms of that initial contact and compression stage of a, of a meteorite impact, the average collisional velocity from a space rock is thought to be around 17 kilometers per second, uh, which you know sounds fast and sounds even faster when you convert that to miles per hour, right? That's just a mere 38,000 miles per hour. So there's an incredible amount of temperature and pressure that gets created at one of these sites, um, you know, unfathomable amounts. And that um, really has the ability to sort of alter what the, you know, the target rock or the, what was, what the impactor hit. And um, it can produce things like shatter cones. That's this texture feature you see here from a sample from Indiana. It can basically melt and vaporize the existing rock there and, and, and produce sort of these black glass melted fragments. That's a sample from, from one in Siberia. Um, and it's those, it's that it's that amount of pressure that those PD, the, the only way to produce those planar deformation features are at pressures greater than around 10 gigapascals. Um, just basic metamorphic, um, you know, earth processes that's those are at occur at much lower temperatures and pressures than what would get produced from, from an impact. Um, so it's just really that force, that speed um, that creates all this kinetic energy and, and impacts are thought to have the kinetic energy, you know, much like an atomic bomb. And that's actually a, 
how shocked quartz was identified in the first place was in the, in the rocks and the soils at these atomic bomb test sites. So, so shock quartz can really only get produced um, from an atomic bomb or a meteorite impact. So I'm gonna show you one more sample set here. So that last one I looked at, we looked at uh, was 3240 and I'm gonna show you uh, 704 here. So that one's, the first one was right in the middle of, of what we think is the crater. And the next one I'm gonna show you is kind of off to the Southern end. So these samples um, look a little bit different than the last set. So we've got this glauconitic sandstone with those phosphatic brachiopod pieces at the top. Uh, below that, we have a little bit more of that without the phosphatic brachiopods and it's a little bit more cemented. Um, and then below that, we've got something similar, the fine grain glauconitic sandstone uh, without the brachiopods and without the cements. And below that, we are getting some more cemented dolostone with just a little bit of glauconite in it. And, um, and then we've got sort of a 200, almost 200 feet of this, of this fine to coarse, sort of typical mature, mature quartz sandstone. We call it mature just because it's almost all quartz. It doesn't have any other minerals associated with it. And then below that, we're getting more of that fine grain sandstone with glauconite and a little bit of cement, and then the uncemented glauconitic sandstone again. And then at the very bottom, we have this red to green shale. And then uh, even below that, the, the gamma log didn't get this deep, but the samples that were drilled um, at this depth are this dark gray carbonate rich shale and siltstone. Um, kind of unlike anything we'd expect at that depth, but it's possible that those um, could be related to the mid-continent rift sediments. Um, so this one, again, was also puzzling um, in terms of what you'd expect to see at these depths in terms of the stratigraphy. It seems as though it almost repeats itself. Um, and so, oops, this is, this is what we, you know, if we didn't really pay attention to what should be there and we just identified the rock based on what we're seeing in the cuttings, um, this is what we our interpretation would be. And if, if you've got a little bit of a geology background, you might under notice that um, the mesoproterozoic rocks should be at the bottom. That, that kind of makes sense for that depth. Um, the Cambrian rocks, uh, should be above that, but there's several hundred feet of missing stratigraphy here um, between the Mesoproterozoic sediments and that, that unit called the Lone Rock. So you're missing more Lone Rock, you're missing uh, Eau Claire and Mount Simon. And then the Jordan sandstone is about twice its general usual thickness across the whole state. So this is a bit odd. And then the oddest part is that there's older rocks than the Jordan, the St. Lawrence and Lone Rock up here above or on top of it. And this would require the, the typical stratigraphic package to be up and overturned on itself. Um, that is something that we don't we don't have any any um, evidence for in the state of Minnesota. Uh, that's something that you might come across in, in the western United States in the uh, where you have mountain building and other geologic features going on, but that is not something uh, we've seen before in the mid in Minnesota or Wisconsin um, or surrounding states. Uh, what we do, what we have seen, are just typical breaks of what we call normal faults, um, where certain rocks from from um, like, for instance, at Barn Bluff and Red Wing, you've got this Jordan sandstone juxtaposed up against older green uh, glauconitic sandstone of the Tunnel City. So we've got typical, you know, near vertical breaks up and down, and those occur um, in areas we've kind of got well established. And, and that's um, different than what we're seeing here um, or describing in, in this sample set. Uh, what we think we see evidence for with this, if this is overturned strata, which the, the samples certainly um, indicate, are what's called an ejecta flat. 
Um, so if you've had uh, the opportunity to travel to Arizona, Behringer Crater, also known as Meteor Crater, where you can see um, the crater at the surface, uh, at, along the rim, here's sort of a cross section of the rim in some areas, you can see where the crater sort of hit, exploded, the strata kind of goes up and out and falls back onto itself, creating this ejecta flap. And then it overturns and sort of settles. And this is what you're, you're left with. This, um, this is overturned on itself, the, the Kaibab and Moen Kopi stratigraphy. That's also something they found in a crater site um, in Iowa, the one known as the Manson Impact Site, where they had younger Devonian or Devician rocks um, below much older Cambrian and even the red clastic rocks. So this does occur at impact sites. Um, so if we start to kind of try to piece this all together in terms of the map um, and what it looks, what it may look like in the subsurface. Um, we've got an area that center circle that appears about four kilometers in diameter. And there's this extended zone of about eight, it would make the whole thing about eight kilometers in diameter, but it is an odd shape and it's following this geomorphic buried valley that, uh, we just need a little bit more um, samples and evidence in this area and kind of to the north of it to, to really better understand what's going on off in this outer zone. But within the crater, we have as much as about 575 feet of this mixed sandstone, siltstone, and shale. And that's this is a cross section north to south, basically this, this red line here. And this just represents these samples within what we're noting as the as the impact structure. Um, the colors are correlate to the stratigraphy. I'll go over those in a second. Um, but just to just to um, go over the cuttings and kind of putting it all together, we see parts of the sequence in these cutting sets that look similar to what should be there, but they're out of stratigraphic order and they're overturned in, in three in different instances. Um, we've got those PDFs um, from the cloudy fractured quartz sand grains. Those occur mostly in this interval at that um, at those at those asterisks. And the upper sequence, as we said, we're in what's known as the just what we call a buried valley. So uh, much later after all of this happened and these rocks were deposited, uh, which we're talking hundreds of million years ago. Um, you know, then the glaciers came through just the last two million years ago and likely created a lot of these valleys and features and refilled it in with uh, sediments of tails and sand and gravels. So all of this overlying white is the overlying glacial material. So so the upper sequence of this structure has, has likely been eroded and how much is kind of hard to say. Um, but we believe the feature or the impact happened during the late Cambrian, which is about 490 million years ago, so a long time ago. Um, and it, and it, we've got, you know, evidence for that uh, is is kind of all relative. Basically, it had to have happened after the Jordan was deposited, right? Because the Jordan sort of blows up and and gets ejected and overturned on itself. So it has to be older than the deposition of the Jordan. The Jordan had to be there in order for that to happen. And um, I'm sorry, younger, and I guess the Jordan had to be there in order for that to happen. And we don't see any evidence in the samples that we have at this time of this upper blue layers, which are the Prairie de Chaine, that, that's gonna be those that thick carbonate unit. We don't see any of that in the samples that we have to work with right now. So that's the evidence we have why we're thinking this is um, a late Cambrian aged impact. Um, so when you have a crater there, you can either classify it um, basically as simple or complex, depending on sort of how it was uh, modified basically at, at the end of its occurrence. And there's simple craters, which are just like, like it sounds, a simple bowl shape uh, with an uplifted rim, a betra filled center, 
And those are generally the smaller sizes of about four kilometers or less. So that would be like Meteor Crater in Arizona where I showed you the picture of. Complex craters are typically larger and they have what are called terrace rims and uplifted center. And they're also filled with plenty of impact breccia on top of this structure. Um, so that's just a, a different classification based on uh, what you see in terms of its shape and morphology. And we believe based on the, you know, the limited data we have that we may be seeing evidence of what's, uh, what we think is a complex crater. And that's because we, we, the, we do have um, rocks that we believe are those deeper uh, mesoproterozoic rocks that have formation names like solar church. Um, and those are much higher in the sequence, several hundred feet than, than they should be. And the Jordan sandstone, which regionally across the area should be at about this elevation, is overturned on itself, like from that one sample and dropped much down, down much lower than it should be. So that could be um, record of sort of one of these fallback sort of terrace rims that have dropped into the into the crater structure. So those are just some of our uh, interpretations to start with. It's kind of hard to make a lot of this or uh, understand a lot of this based on the limited subsurface points that we have, um, but, but, but pretty remarkable that we can see what we can um, from the data that we have as well. So it's kind of fun to think about project uh, projectile size estimates, right? Like how large would this space rock had to have been um, to produce a crater four kilometers across? And so there's some, um, you know, fun crater calculators out there on the internet where you can kind of type in a lot of assumptions, um, but to get a sense of the size of the rock that um, that hit Earth. 490 million years ago in Invergrove Heights. And, and what based on sort of a four kilometer diameter and average um, density of meteorites that we know of and an average velocity of an impact of 17 kilometers per second um, and the density of, of sort of the sandy deposits that would have been there that it would have hit, um, this crater or this the size of this rock would have been um, anywhere between sort of one and three football fields across. So pretty, pretty big impact. Um, and, and an impact that large in terms of energy would have produced something about 30 times more powerful than the largest nuclear bomb. So some great, great forces involved here to uh, disturb this much of a region's sort of um, geology. So in terms of um, kind of where we're going with it, we, we feel like we've just sort of started to understand this structure and, and, and created the, the map of the area. Um, there's plenty more we'd like to um, understand as time goes on into the future. We'd like to make more analogs um, and understand more um, other craters that may be of um, hit these sedimentary sandstones in other areas. So we'd like to sort of see how it compares against some other sandstone um, target craters. Um, there's some geophysical methods that we'd like to um, bring in and sort of better understand the structure based on sort of remote work we can do from the surface, like gravity measurements, and just kind of getting at the density on versus off the crater to better understand its its um, distribution and structure. Uh, we'd like to drill into it a little bit. These samples uh, were all just on the shelf uh, um, given to us from drillers over the last um, 20, 30 years. And, and so we'd finally with this map project gotten to have a, you know, had time to open up these, these samples and, and learn about this area. Um, but we'd like to put in some more holes to um, better learn about the structure as well. And you know the, the map I'm showing on the right is just where all the water wells are. Some of them are sealed, um, but but the area does um, you know produce water to to many different homes and businesses. 
um, in the area. So there's sort of a groundwater story to this too. Um, we'd like to look into um, trying to get some samples and seeing if um, the, the, there's any um, traces of this in, in the groundwater. We don't suspect that there, there would be, but um, some, some impact structures are associated with things like salinity or fluoride or sulfate. So that's something uh, that could be looked into. Uh, in terms of the rarity of this, um, it is pretty rare, right? There's only about 200 confirmed global uh, impact sites um, on Earth. So we, you know, if confirmed and accepted into this database, you know, maybe we we would add to this list, but one of 200 is is pretty rare. And you know, structures on this list uh, range from just several meters across, real small features to uh, large, very large complex structures, uh, 160 kilometers across. Uh, that'd be the one in South Africa that's considered one of the biggest. And they occur in geologic formations as old as 2 billion years old, all the way to one on the list um, in Peru is, we, 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 it was um, seen basically hit, um, for just 14 years ago. And that's one of the smallest, that is the smallest one on the list and also the youngest. Um, about a third of these are totally buried and we wouldn't have really found them any other way than just doing drilling or looking at subsurface geologic samples. Uh, that includes Chicxulub and the Chesapeake Bay structure. So the other two thirds um, can be seen um, to some degree at the surface, but a third of them are totally buried. Like, like the Invergrove Heights or Pine Bend example. Now, um, the Earth has much fewer craters than the moon or other planetary bodies, right? We just have noticed about 200 and the moon and other planetary bodies have hundreds and hundreds, thousands. Um, well, that's just because the geologic processes on Earth, uh, like plate tectonics, you wrote erode or erase craters with time. And calculations have been done to see how often craters should be produced on Earth and um, kind of taking away the, the Earth's erosion rate. And, and they've um, determined that there are still several hundred more small craters that should be present on Earth's surface, either maybe, maybe seen from um, the surface, but also likely but also more likely, likely buried. Um, and that, those are the smaller ones. So six kilometers or less. So that's just basically, you know, this part of the curve is less dense in terms of these confirmed craters than, than this part. So we think we have a lot of the larger craters confirmed or found on Earth, but there are still, it is estimated that several hundred could, could be left, left to be found. Um, so, so we've got maybe one of those that we're dealing with um, in, at Pine Bend. Now, uh, regionally, this, this would be Minnesota's first crater. Uh, we have no others documented in the state. Uh, Wisconsin has several, Iowa has several, to the north of us uh, in Canada, there are several. Um, so, so it, you know, it, it would be expected that we, we, you know, we should have one. Um, I, it just took us a, a while to find it, right? And um, the, if you look at uh, the other, you know, in terms of the other ones, um, Manson, Iowa, that's one I, I, I mentioned that is about 74 million years old. It's, it's, um, so it's much younger than what we're dealing with. Uh, Rock Elm and uh, Decora, those are thought to be Ordovician in age, so this 480 or so million years old. And we have something that's just a touch older than that at 490. Um, so that's just kind of in terms of ages where things play out. Um, so although this would be Minnesota's first crater, Minnesota does have ejecta from the Sudbury impact event. And the Sudbury impact event is just um, to the northeast of us. Uh, you can see there on the map, the Sudbury Basin. And anywhere in those red areas are where ejecta, or basically sort of the tsunami wave that was created based on the Sudbury event, 
uh, deposited rocks as far away as you know 500 miles or so. Um, so you maybe have heard about the, the um, you may have heard about impacts related to Minnesota, but but that would have just been the ejecta uh, related to the Sudbury event. And the Sudbury event is very large. It's a 150 mile wide crater. It affected sort of Precambrian crystalline basement rock. Uh, it has plenty of shock features, shatter cones, and it also it actually um, was such a large collision that it melted um, the rock and um, and it got basically nickel, copper, palladium, gold, and platinum group elements that they're actually mining at that site from the impact. So in terms of the importance of impacts on Earth and, and why they're studied, um, you know, other than being really fun and something to think about sort of outside of our, our um, you know, our normal things we think about on a daily basis, uh, they're, they're a major factor in our planet's geological and biological history. Um, they're really the only thing can, that can um, generate an instantaneous geological structure. Um, they generate regional and global ejecta layers affecting climate on Earth. They um, can produce basically their own melted large igneous rock um, at the site, like, like that Sudbury example, um, and like that Sudbury example as well, some of our are so associated with economic mineral and petroleum deposits. And um, as you've likely uh, learned, they're also associated with major biological extinctions, including the Chicxulub uh, crater in Mexico that's associated with the demise of the dinosaurs. They're really the only thing we have on Earth to serve as an analog for other planetary surfaces. Um, and they're, you know, we, we study them to understand the nature and scale of impact risks and mitigation to our planet in the future. Uh, we study them to just better understand the formation processes of our planet and solar system in general. And the um then there's the importance of impact craters and cratering processes. To, you know, the more we understand about them, there's sort of the potential to um, have, maybe there are recoverable resources um, on some of the ones on Earth, but as well as some on, on other planetary surfaces or the moon. So, so that's um, something to think about in our, in our far off future, so. And with that, um, I, I think I'll stop there and, um, and I'd be happy to take any questions related to um, the talk or geology of Minnesota. Thank you very much, uh, Julia Steenberg. And I will say to the audience, I see that we do have a few questions to begin with, but we have plenty of time for more. So if you have questions, uh, now's the time to type them into the q and I, I want to ask a question myself. Um, so I, I understand, uh, of course, uh, the crater is, is created by the impact of the meteorite of you know, varying size. Does that mean that there is actual outer space rock in those core samples that, that you're pulling up? And is it possible to determine what came, you know, it came from outer space? Is it possible to determine that when you do the, the um, sample analysis? Yep, that's a great question. It it is sort of assumed that at that size um, of a diameter crater and that size of rock that would hit, there would have been so much pressure that it would have yeah. just been totally vaporized. So there, it really isn't expected that we'd see mm -hmm. much of that signature. I mean, it could be preserved in places. We, we haven't mm -hmm. come across it in, in the samples. Um, mm -hmm. But but yes, um, doing some more sort of grinding up whole rock geochemical uh, analysis of the samples, uh, if if we get some of that work done, may show a signal. But but mm -hmm. so far we haven't seen that. But again, it, it at that at that size, it, it's it's almost assumed that it would have just kind of all been destroyed and vaporized. Oh, too bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Well, let's turn to the questions. The first question is: You spoke of something the sort of top layer. Uh, I think uh, breccia. What is breccia? This questioner asks. Did yeah. I pronounce it correctly? Or? Yep, exactly. Um, so 
if you think of like, um, well, sedimentary rocks have certain types of names. So breccia is just the formal name for a certain type of sedimentary rock. And that's a rock mm -hmm. that's composed of many other rock types. Um, but those rocks, it's the variable rock types it's composed of are usually quite angular. So mm -hmm. there's really only a couple different ways to make a breccia, you know, to get such mm -hmm. angular rocks kind of all lithified into one sequence of, of many different lithologies. And one is, you know, to have such great forces like an impact or a tsunami wave could mm -hmm. create rip up, you know, so something along those lines, that's how a breccia uh, would get created. So they're just associated with impacts, you know, tsunamis. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. you see fault breccia where just the geologic fault happen and kind of in the middle, there's some breaking up of the rocks that's going on. So just a, just angular, um, an angular sort of sedimentary rock of variable compositions. Why is it called breccia? Where does that word come from? Um, that's a great question. I, I'd have to Google that. I, I can't, I don't okay. know that answer off the top of my head. Oh, all right. Well, let's move on. Cause I know, you know, answers to a lot of other questions here. Uh, when this meteor hit, which would have been 490 million years ago, I think, um, was there any life forms on earth? And if so, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, you know, right in this, well, the setting would have been sort of a ancient marine well, you think of the Bahamas, right? Um, mm -hmm. Sort of, sort of, sort of mid to shallow marine um, uh -huh. sandstones and and you know coral reefs. So there's there'd be plenty of these um, um, inner you know um, fossils like we we're familiar with from that time period, like uh, the brachiopods, like little seashell type organisms, mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. So. Uh, invertebrates, we call them just sort of seashell-like fauna, um, uh, would, have, would have definitely been present, um, but doesn't always get preserved very well in, in, in that setting, but, but, but that's what, what would have been affected. Okay. Um, I think this is a variation on the question that I asked, but maybe there are other things you want to add. Um, are there never-before-seen materials identified in meteors? Um, it's a great question. Again, I, I'm not, I, I've just learned a lot about meters, <laughs> uh, you know, uh -huh. from finding this structure in the last year or two, but uh -huh. I'm sure, I'm sure there has been new things found from, from, you know, meteorite samples, um, from outer space that we didn't really know about. There's, there's yeah. one em element called iridium, and that's something that is, is, occurs in higher concentrations in meteorites or outer space rock than it does in on earth usually. So sometimes you look for what's known as this iridium anomaly or the spike of, of a certain type of um, element that was associated with meteorites versus versus earth. So there's definitely things like that 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 are looked into at, at sites mm -hmm. geo, geochemically yep, in the in the samples. And maybe a related question, uh, this question or a different questioner asks, is there an unusual distribution of metallic elements at the Pine Bend site? Yeah, and that's something we don't see any metallic elements from, from the mm -hmm. meteor, um, from what would have been there. And so we, we're kind of assuming it was likely all obliterated or vaporized, which is normal for something of that size. Yes. Um, when you look at that, um, I showed that AeroMeg image, or that we like mm -hmm. to call it the MRI of the state of Minnesota. It it is very close to these basalt rocks that are there from the rift that sort mm -hmm. of overprint any smaller signature that would have been there. So um, it's possible. We just haven't uh, found it yet, and the the current um, maps that we have are just there they're just don't they we'd have to do more finer scale in depth looking at the magnetic uh, minerals from the surface uh, which is something that could possibly be done in the future okay um it, it, people are inevitably me too interested in the extinction of the dinosaurs I'm not sure if you're an expert on that but uh, there are going to be questions anyway um you talked about the uh, was it the Chicxulub crater in, in Mexico. Uh, how can one crater have led to the extinction 
of an entire sphere, a group of species. How can, what do you think about that meteor theory uh, producing the, the end of the dinosaurs? Yeah, well, there's a, I mean, the, I don't remember the size of that one off the top of my head, but it's very mm -hmm. large. It's on the, it's, you know, it's some of the top, it's one of the top five or 10, I, I believe. So something of that such, of such mm -hmm. great size would have produced um, a lot of global could have produced a lot of global uh, climatic mm -hmm. impacts and that would have been you know first from sort of the explosion of 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 hitting the earth to creating this dust cloud uh, that would have been brought up into the atmosphere and initially sort of um, blocked out the sunlight so there would have been you know cooling happening uh, mm -hmm. um, because of sunlight you know not getting to the plants and then there would have just been all these just raging fires as well that would have happened just from mm -hmm. you know the the explosion as well so you've got sort of just um a lot of environmental effects that are just extremely widespread you know think of you know mm -hmm. something 50 times more powerful than an atomic bomb it's it's going to have yeah. some global catastrophe associated with it so if most, the, yeah. oh, i'm sorry go ahead no that's okay Okay, so if a meteor killed off the dinosaurs, as we think possible, I mean, is it inevitable this is going to happen again? Uh, we have a question here. Why haven't there been more recent uh, meteors uh, colliding with Earth, meteorites colliding with Earth? Yeah, and, and that's something that um, others study in terms of uh, the mm -hmm. rate at, at, at how, how often they hit. Um, there's risk assessment even that's been done on uh, on that and mm -hmm. and I don't remember those numbers off the top of my head you can you can spend some time having fun putting these questions into Google and yeah. coming up with some fun answers but there I mean I um I think that you're no I can't remember there was a statistic I read once and now I'm probably going to get it wrong so I shouldn't even say it but there's you can <laughs> compare your chances to winning the lottery to being hit by <laughs> an asteroid and I, I think it's actually I think you actually have more likelihood of hitting getting hit by an asteroid. Um, <laughs> but um, so there, which is deeply disturbing any way you I look know. at it. <laughs> and in in human history, or at least recorded history, there are several instances of stuff like this happening. Um, mm -hmm. One happened uh, sort of over in Russia uh, in in the 1900s, and, and but never actually hit the ground. Sort of exploded right before it hit, mm -hmm. and that's what happens a lot of times: is sort of smaller space rocks come to the atmosphere and then kind of explode and burn up before it mm -hmm. even you know, it even gets hit. So that's what happens with some of the smaller pieces. Um, you know, there you know NASA's actively uh, in, involved in that DART mission that happened several months ago, right? Where they're sort of tracing, you know, impact bodies around Earth and that may come in contact with our orbit, and they're keeping track of all of them they they can find and and sort mm -hmm. of tracking them um, and and um, sort of testing that hypothesis of whether they can actually you know, intercept it or, or put it off its course. And like, like we saw in the movies in the nineties, right. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and, 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 and that they've determined that, 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 that was mm -hmm. a success um, on that mission a, a while ago. So it is something that NASA, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and people uh, are studying and looking into for sure. So on that same topic, if a meteor was, you know, headed for us, would we have advanced knowledge? And then a question uh, is, uh, what has been learned about mitigation prevention of uh, a meteor strike? Yeah, and again, it's a little bit out of my expertise, but I, um, from what I've learned, uh, we we do have a good eye on the sky. We we kind of have, you know, there's still mm -hmm. there's still a chance that something's going to come out of nowhere. I guess. Yes. <laughs> I can't. Yes. We can't totally <laughs> blow that off, yeah. but. Mm -hmm. um, but chances are pretty low and we have a good idea of what's out there. And, um, you know, I, I think we'd have, um, I don't even, I don't, you know, I'd be just guessing at this point, but I, you know, mm -hmm. I think we'd have, you know, years or months to, to, um, to know, Get ready. <laughs> you know what, what, if there was something or, or to try to mitigate it. Yeah. Sir. Um, and the next question, I don't totally understand it. So perhaps you could understand, you could explain the significance of this. This questioner says, has sampling or investigation of meteors revealed the presence of ionizing radiation? And, and could you answer that question and then tell me why it's significant for those of us who 
don't know as much science as, as the questioner. Yeah, no, that's a little bit out of my expertise too. But I, I think that there's just this idea that these rocks, you know, maybe have radiation associated with them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's possible. I, I just, I'm sorry, I just don't really, I don't know, I don't have a good handle on 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 if if ones have actually been known to have radiation associated with them or not or how many mm -hmm. um i i don't i don't understand that aspect okay. of it sure um did tectonic plate movement change the latitude and longitude of the pine bend impact crater after it was created yep that's that's a great question um so back during the Cambrian time period when we thought, mm -hmm. uh, when we think this happened, um, we would have been situated, the whole region, Minnesota, mm -hmm. Midwest, would have been situated down at the equator. And since that time, we've sort of moved to our current position. So, so the answer is yes, but it's sort of, it didn't mm -hmm. just move the crater, you know, it took the whole area around it and kind of moved yes. the continents with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, here's a question I love. If the universe is expanding, shouldn't there be fewer things to collide with? Boy, I don't know. I mean, yes, if the, if that's the, the case. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's there's millions of rocks floating around in outer space. I don't think we've had them all. We have them all tracked, but um, yeah. I'd have to look yeah. into that. Maybe. I'll, I'll <laughs> mention to the audience and to our speaker, I am married to an astronomer. I'm going to ask him this question. Yeah. So if anybody's interested, tune in next week. Hopefully I'll have an answer from a from an Thank astronomer. You. Yes, that's that's who we'd need to answer that question. Okay. Um okay. Uh well, and then another question is just seems to be such a fixation on. Uh, the Chikaluba, Chikalub, uh, wondering why Earth hasn't been knocked out of orbit given the power of these collisions, especially considering the size and consequences of Chikalub. Did I pronounce that right? Chikalub? How do you say that? I say it like Chikalub. Um, Chikalub. Okay. Thank you. But I, I could be wrong. Uh, you know, it's um, <laughs> Spanish and I, I don't okay. speak that much Spanish, but. Um, uh, yeah, I I don't know what it would take to Earth knock Earth off its orbit. That's a great question too. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm 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 not going to be able to to answer that one very well. Um, okay. Well, here's one. I, I think know. you probably. Uh, I'm I'm sorry to keep asking, but it, everybody's just so fascinated with the I, the I death know. of the dinosaurs. You know, um, on the coast of West Africa, there is a crater. Do you know the country? Where is that located? Is there a um, major crater in, in Africa? West yeah, Africa? I, well, there's one in South, Af South mm -hmm. Africa, um, and, which is the one uh, I can just go back, I think, because it's not that far. Um, I think they, that's the one known as Verde Fort. So that is one of the largest structures mm -hmm. um, off the coast of South Africa. And I, you know, I haven't been there. I don't, I don't know that much about it based on just a little bit I've read, but but that's yeah. that that's the one there that's its name all right and now we have a, a viewer who says i'd like to take an adult ed course in geology where can i go to find one and i will add failing that is there a book that you would recommend for someone who's looking for a sort of basic introduction uh to um to geology boy um that's a great question i I don't get asked that very often, so I don't. I don't know if you can just up, apply um, to the U of M to sort of um, take a sort of a class, not for credit. I, I thought they used to be able to to do that, so I would look into that. I would look into U of M admissions and and see if you're uh, able to sort of um, sit in on on a geology class. You know, and there's there's so many geology and. There's several state universities and colleges, you know, if, if you're not, not in the metro area, um, or even if you are, there, there's there's so many um, programs out there that teach, you know, just from the basic geology 101 to sort of all the way through an undergraduate education. Um, and then, you know, 
all the way through a PhD. So that, you know, just thinking of the U of M, all the, all the courses they have to offer, um, it, it's pretty extensive catalog, but, um, but I, I wouldn't know how to tell you how to, how to do that exactly, except for contacting either, either a geology department you're interested in taking classes from or, or admissions. Yeah. And in um, terms of books, I guess, mm -hmm. um, kind of looking at my stack, uh, I mean, there's, there's so many just um, basic, you know, guide to fossils in North America or, or, or um, geol you know, just basic um, geology 101 textbooks that I'm sure several libraries um, carry. Um, there's, in terms of Minnesota geology, you know, sort of there's, we offer a roadside um, geology of Minnesota, which is kind of a neat book where you can um, learn all about the different geology of Minnesota. And it, other states have these roadside guides um, as well. And it sort of takes you on a route and learn, and, and it has information in the book about, about the geology of, of the area. So well, what are, is the name uh, of the roadside? It's the Roadside Guide to Minnesota Geology. Uh, yeah, the it? official name is Roadside Geology of Minnesota. Right, Roadside Geology of Minnesota. Okay, uh, Paul uh, McClagan, if you would allow me to, uh, I can't uh, put something to everyone in the chat at the moment. Uh, if you would open that possibility to me, I will type in uh, as many of these titles as I can, uh, but I can't do it at the moment. Um, okay, yeah. uh, let's see. I notice uh, says, um, uh, the speak or the questioner. I noticed from the collision map that the craters are clustered in locations. Why is that? Yep, that's a that's a great question. Um, so it's a couple different reasons. I think there's just certain areas um, that are more amenable to studying over the course of time. Um, you know, it you know. North America is a pretty safe place to do geology. There's other places that um, aren't considered um, to be very safe or accessible. Um, so, I mean, and that could just be in terms of safety, but it could be in terms of elevation or just reaching some of these very remote places. Um, but it also has to do with preservation. Um, sedimentary rocks in general are a great place to sort of preserve geologic events through time. And so, uh, finding a crater in a sedimentary package um, is is um, it just it it you know it happened and then overlying rocks deposited on top of it so the structure was preserved um, versus you know if you just hit like something like a an old granite and then you know no other seas came and buried rocks on top of it 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 may have been eroded with geologic time so there are certain settings that preserve um, these features. So it has to do with their preservation, but it also has to do with just um, ac accessing the sites and, and, and um, getting to places that are less, re um, uh, more remote. So in other words, it's not that, that the uh, 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 craters are clustered, it's that the research, uh, the field work is clustered, not not the incidence of the craters themselves. There's, yep, there's that. And then the, you also, I guess the other third thing you have to think of is the age of the crust in general. Um, the mm -hmm. ocean crust is all relatively young compared to some the continental crust. So there sure. are craters that have been found in the ocean. They're hard to find in the ocean, right? It's covered by mm -hmm. uh, plenty of water. And, and so you just don't um, get a sense of where, you know, you don't, you just don't see what, what the ocean floor looks like everywhere. Um, but, um, but the ocean floor is also much younger. Um, and so, you know, those would have been, you know, it sort of recycles itself over time. And, so that's why there's less found um, in, in younger geologic areas. It just had less time um, to, to, um, to, to preserve, to, to record one, or chances of recording one. OK. Um, the next uh, uh, comment really uh, deals with the previous question who, questioner who was looking for a, 
an introductory course, a basic course on geology for adults. Um, this person says, I think the University of Minnesota has a geographic society that offers free lectures. Um, and I will add uh, anyone in the audience over 60, and I think that describes a good uh, chunk of the audience, uh, anyone over 60 in Minnesota can take uh, classes at the U for free at the University of Minnesota. So that's something else to think about. All yeah, right. No, and, and well, and thanks for mentioning that to that person. Um, we yes, there is the um, so that we are the Minnesota Geological Survey, but there is something called the Minnesota Geological Society, and that's mm -hmm. a great group. Um, uh, uh, like you say, a, a lot of just older um, retired uh, people with an interest in geology that they offer, I think, monthly uh, evening seminars on Zoom or and they may be mm -hmm. on in person. Um, there's also the Minnesota Mineral Club. Um, some of these places I've talked to over the last year or so about this crater, so they're on the top of my head. But, uh -huh. but those are those are two um, of the of the larger um, geology uh, clubs in, in Minnesota for for the public. And I will say to the audience, uh, I, I don't want to take the time to do it now, but I will find uh, the website for those two organizations. The Geologic Society uh, and the Minnesota Mineral Club, and anyone who's interested in in uh, finding uh, out uh, more about that, uh, just email me. Most of you have my email address, and I'll send you back the link to their websites. Um, all right, uh, here's a questioner who wants to know, what will you be focusing on in your research in coming years? Yeah, so... Um... You know, my position here is mostly geologic mapper. So uh, although I'd like to keep mapping Dakota County forever, I can't. <laughs> um, I, I work out, uh, I've been working out more um, in Southwest Minnesota as of recently. So my mapping in Dakota County is kind of finished up. Um, but but this is interesting uh, enough and, and a, such a unique discovery that we do want to keep um, keep learning as much about it as we can. So, so hopefully there is some drilling in our future where we can um, get, get an actual rock core instead of these mm -hmm. ground up cuttings that we can learn more about the structure, maybe see some of those real sedimentary features like breccia that we just can't see from the ground up samples we have to work with. So we'd like to get some better sampling, um, finding, finding uh, where to put those in the ground and and, and this this structure is several hundred feet below ground so it's it's um, expensive to retrain those but um, but but that is where um, the near my near focus will be is see if we can um, come across to to get some funding and to get some core samples just to to learn more about it to do more geochemical analyses on this and, and so on mm -hmm. so so that's that's where I hope um, to go, and and I and I I do hope that um, we can learn more about sort of the the groundwater story of things. You know, does it carry any signatures different than the surrounding area, and is there is there a story there? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we have about ten more minutes, and so uh, we do have time uh, for more questions. So I'll say to the audience, you know, here's your chance. If you have a geologic question uh, for our speaker, uh, type it in now. Uh, while we're waiting to see if there are other questions, I have a question that goes way back to the very beginning when you were setting the stage, and you talked, you you showed a map uh, with the sort of strata of Paleozoic versus Mesozoic uh, rock formations in various parts of the state of Minnesota. And my question is, what determines what uh, age of rock formation is found in a given area? You know, I, it seemed as if the, I, I think I remember a Paleozoic to the north and Mesozoic around the Twin Cities area. Yeah. What determines that? Um. Well, again, it's it's kind of just from from all the subsurface information we've gathered, uh, what we can, what we think is is in the ground. Um, it why has is to, it? Right. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, so so originally, you know, we would have had um, from the oldest Precambrian time, we would have had sort of these blocks of of continental crust sort of colliding and merging into each other, sort of forming that uh, what we call the uh, original craton. Uh, um, would have been so we would have been sort of 
um, part of Canada and part of, uh, of Minnesota and the Dakotas would have been this original craton. And then the Paleozoic seas came in at sea level, sea level, you know, over, over geologic history has sort of risen and fall to great degrees. The Paleozoic was a time where sea level was, was much higher. So we were getting, um, you know, ancient beach deposits sort of, and, and sea level was much higher, but then it, it also fluctuated up and down a little bit throughout the Paleozoics, which is why you'd get sort of sand, you know, if you get sandstone with shale on top of it, and then limestone on top of that, that's that, th that those three rocks represent a sea level rise. So as mm -hmm. you know, the water goes up, you're getting these deeper environments of rocks keep depositing on top of the shallower ones. So, so you know, it's just a mix of of, of climate throughout Earth's history and um, and sea level fluctuations. And then we had a time, you know, there was a long time between the old, some of the oldest rocks we have in the southern part of the state are Devonian. There's several time periods between that that we don't have record of. And those are recorded in other places across the world, mm -hmm. but just not right here in Minnesota. We don't have anything for several hundred more years, hundred million more years, until the Cretaceous seas came in more from the from the our towards our southwest. Um, and those would have been the same Cretaceous seas that deposited, you know, all the like the Morrison formation and all the geologic formations that have all the dinosaurs in them, like out in Colorado and, and the western. United States. So we were part of that story in Minnesota, but we were kind of the eastern margin where we weren't very deep. Um, so, so it's just kind of a record of geologic time through and, and what gets preserved. Um, and, um, you know, our record isn't con totally continuous or complete, um, but mm -hmm. um, there's, there's plenty of places where we just had non-deposition or erosion going on. Um, but but this is but but this is what was left for us to to study. Um, and here's a question I think building on this is the geological era rocks that are found largely determined by the degree of erosion at any given location. So the rocks you find at any given location are they uh, determined largely by the degree of erosion? I guess. Um, I guess later, you know, once they all were deposited. Um, then we have this whole other record of geologic history that we didn't really talk about. Just the last two million years was the, the glacial time period where large mm -hmm. ice, continental ice sheets covered um, northern, you know, North America and came down and sort of came back up and came down and left large deposits of till. So that also did a lot of erosion uh, when, when that was occurring. So a lot of that upper landscape that we see is probably a reflection of how much erosion the glaciers actually did before they sort of melted for the last time. Um, and so there's, it's a degree of erosion um, to, to some aspect of it, yeah. Um, but in terms of the age and how we identify it, you know, we, these formations are pretty easily identifiable in terms of their stratigraphic package. You can kind of relatively date them based on where they occur. And the oldest one should be at the bottoms in terms of the Paleozoics and the youngest mm -hmm. one should be at the top. And, um, but there is plenty of um, older biostratigraphy that has been done um, um, years ago where they sort of look at ages of trilobites and ages of these little materials called conodonts and little teeth-like materials. And so mm -hmm. there's been sort of intense paleos, um, intense biostratigraphic studies that have been done to sort of be able to date, to date these uh, more formally, but that's not something we, we do much in our mapping anymore because that work's sort of been worked out and done. Okay, well, I, we are just about out of time and we are out of questions. Uh, so I want to thank our speaker, uh, Julia Steenberg, very much. I want to thank uh, Paul McClagan, behind the scenes, Carmi Blythus, also behind the scenes. And I want to thank most of all our audience. Uh, you never let me down. You came up with great questions. I know this is a little bit out of our normal wheelhouse for programming. Um, but uh, we're all the better for it. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I want to invite everyone to come back next week when we will welcome uh, photographer Doug Omen on the topic of vanishing Minnesota. So thank you very much. And for today, I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs>